subvert the dominant social order through a precise use of ridicule sarcasm and humor the important words here are abuse and unofficial on 14th september 2019 home minister amit shah remarks on hindi divas that the entire nation should come together to promote hindi as a national language according to 2018 census 43% of people speak hindi in india and shah's remarks entail that remaining 57% would have to learn a language completely not native to them keeping aside the political urgency that this subject asks for the whole incident could be seen as an attempt to make hindi as an overarching official language now abuse which is an important element of unofficial language its traces could be seen increasing in hindi which is being pushed as an official language the growing popularity of creative wordplay in indian politics has reduced hindi into a language of political sloganeering the display of an enormous amount of creativity and linguistic innovations in hurling abuses to semiotically dominate the person or party in opposition is surging in this burgeoning creative inventory particularly worrisome is the absolute abuse to which hindi language is subjected to at the same time there is a proliferation of a culture and political practice that legitimizes the use of such abuse in order to ensure larger political participation in significant ways in this context bakhtin avers it is characteristic of for the familiar speech of the marketplace to use abusive language insulting words or expressions some of them quite lengthy and complex the abuse is grammatically and semantically isolated from context and is regarded as a complete unit something like a proverb this is why we can speak of abusive language as of a special genre of billingsgate abusive expressions are not homogeneous in origin they had various functions in primitive communication and had in most cases the character of magic and incantations these abuses were ambivalent while humiliating and mortifying they at the same time revived and renewed it was precisely the ambivalent uh, ambivalent uh, ambivalent abuse which determined the genre of speech in carnival intercourse but its meaning underwent essential transformation it lost its magic and specific practical direction and eventually acquired an intrinsic universal character and depth there is a significant abuse of a language for political participation the political abuse of hindi and its use for purely increasing the political spectrum in present day politics is something which warrants more attention today before delving into the strategies deployed by the political practitioners to harness the most from this semiotic exercise of verbal wrangling and the violence done with words it is important to know what abuse means in a political canvas and the impact it could usher the practice of hurling abuse in a political scenario is not an essential prerequisite however the intersection of the two shows a lot about emerging political behaviors culture and practices sahana udupa in one of her essays uh, titled politics of gali culture clarifies rather than a mere constellation of intentional tit for tat actions abuse frames the context where meanings of political participation are reconfigured she further adds abusive trolls were not mere accusations of professional lapses or cynical comments on loss of judgment but a constant flow of tweets which hurled common swear words in hindi and new hybrid forms of abuses mixing hindi english and several regional languages such a caustic use of language to humiliate others and particularly for gross violation of someone's dignity deserves no special academic scrutiny national integration does not only mean being united by a common language and one's ability to speak other languages it is also about inculcating the ability and tolerance to listen to others no language is entitled to abuse and violence it is subjected to in present scenario as the list of abusive terms and accusatory acronyms multiplies in india there are many languages simultaneously existing and flowing at the same time the linguistic chart is as diverse as the geography and there is no such entity as common language here thus by default indian society offers cultural plurality that presupposes negotiation and understanding of other cultures 
a slightly deep historical venture would show that languages in india have a shared pluralistic heritage they are a result of confluence of different cultures languages and traditions it is later that they are standardized and isolated for various reasons in a similar vein ipshita chanda in one of her essays entitled 18th century crossovers where she is talking about confluence of languages she argues to show how distinct languages share idiom and vocabulary growing into and out of each other that hindustani language formed as a result of various linguistic confrontations or confluence of languages she further discusses about the separation of urdu from hindustani at the end of 18th century due to pressure of linguistic nationalism and colonial intervention this is to show that the splitting of languages their standardization and eventually the linguistic divisions of the states is contrary to the real spirit of the indian society and its tradition of sufi and bhakti poetry in the same way the origin of sufi and bhakti movements differs considerably but their fundamental tenets are largely similar these traditions gradually developed with a strong social acceptance and are truly revolutionary for their times these movements portray protest against the traditional warped religious norms and conventions these poets heralded a different sort of modernity by ascribing to a pluralistic imagination which enables them not to make distinctions between languages and their usage by a singular community the compartmentalization of languages is a result of growing identity based politics amir khusro may be hailed as the most pluralistic of these writers for his creative use of mixed persian and hindi in the composition of ghazals which initiated the development of urdu years later similarly bhakti and sufi poets used metaphors and vocabulary interchangeably for instance braj poets have frequently resorted to words and metaphors attributed to krishna bhakti echoes of the same could be found in sufi saints bhakti poets also used persianized and arabic phrases in their writings there is no hesitance amongst these rise writers to adopt words from other languages and traditions with the standardization of languages the plurality of the ethos is fractured linguistic nationalism is one of the reasons behind fracturing of linguistic plurality it fosters a spirit of animosity towards other languages and cultures eventually bolstering the idea of exclusive nationalism this espousal of negativity towards other cultures and languages gets accredited and legitimized by political practitioners twitter is so real time that it has crude our language a social media user based in mumbai tells urupa as she goes on to discuss about how certain communicative architectures condition the possi possi possibility for political participation thus the ramifications are not limited to political practitioners it also envisages a vast majority of people online and offline working at grassroots levels to sustain popularity for dominant ideologies in the misogyny that pervades the indian politics and conveniently passes for discourse what is notably perplexing is the impunity with which politicians do it and the confusing morality of those who defend it when the offenders is one of their own or the target is on the opposition side the use of language in this in these self declared transgressive spaces where the blame game actually wakes up to haywire improvisations in terms of linguistic verbal gymnast is abominable victimization of languages for vested interest needs to be taken more sensitively and seriously manglesh dabral veteran hindi poet and writer gathers attention towards the use of hindi exclusively for protest and terrorizing minorities In one of his interviews he claims that Hindi is now used only for chanting Jai Shri Ram Pakistan ya Kabristan and Bharat Mata ki Jai He ex he expresses lament over being born into a language that is now used only for showcasing power and has come across in most ugly avatars in popular usage Hindi is victimized due to its abuse by political practitioners and also by those who reject it just because it gets accidentally identified with a political party trying to claim monopoly over it vis-a-vis -vis various means in the language bruhaha it is ultimately languages which are victimized and used sometimes to protest to unify and at times as divisive techniques even for those who try to take exclusive copyright of hindi the language is just another political weapon to decide what it means to belong to the nation and who gets to belong 
the push for institutionalization of hindi and its greater acceptance amongst the masses has got nothing to do with hindi in real it has an ulterior motive to homogenize society in a similar vein akbar ahmed discusses about two modern trends emerging in pakistan especially devoted to nation building he talks about pakistanization of culture and the awamification of society so now i'll throw some light on these two concepts pakistanization means the development of a certain uniformity of values clothes and aspirations a homogeneity growing over the diverse ethnicity it includes an understanding of urdu as the national language even the most remote parts of pakistan now understand and speak urdu a considerable achievement since it is the mother tongue of less than 10% of the population and regarded as a foreign language by many son of the soil nationalist the media especially television have ensured that urdu is now the unchallenged language of pakistan awamification on the other hand the word derives from the word awam meaning of the people or masses there has been a distinct awamification in pakistan in so far as ordinary people have gained power wealth and rights as never before A similar pattern could be seen emerging in Indian society as efforts are made towards persistent sensitization and hinduizing of Indian society. Historian Ramchandra Guha in a similar context expresses concern over India becoming Hindu Pakistan. In Patriots and Partisans he writes Hindu right as represented in an erratic fashion by Bharatiya Janata Party in a more resolute manner by the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh the Vishwa Hindu Parishad the bajrang dal and other associated organization remains the greatest challenge to the idea of plural india the challenge to plurality came when the explicit rhetoric of hindu muslim unity is no longer required more significantly the nationalist imagination that flourished so spectacularly at the time of the swadeshi movement actually naturalized a conception of the nation in history that was quite distinctly hindu says path chatterjee post independence the display of unity might not be required to evoke nationhood and thus a shift occurs from nationalism to communalism the inner repulsions within society led to the formation of a completely new class of hindus and especially muslims at the end of 19th century they chose to identify more and more with urdu speaking north indian aristocratic culture in order to secure an identity for themselves what is even worse is that all these incidents are explained by the nationalist entrepreneurs in terms of historical necessity as something which is inevitable the post independent india faces an even greater challenge of weaving an identity not only against the shadow of the british but also against pakistan thereafter the target is to purge hindi absolutely of its persian arabic and urdu influences and present hindi in its more sanskritic form in its politically engineered life however hindi is more sanskritic hindu and upper caste urdu begins to be identified more and more with muslims and muslims are minoritized due to which urdu is automatically marginalized athar faruqi in one of his seminal essay urdu not a language name but the city of shah jahanabad writes urdu speakers suffered marginalization followed by alienation after partition the slogan hindu hindi hindustani was concocted in the early part of 20th century and helped reinforce the belief that hindi was the language of hindus and urdu was or ought to be the language of muslims and at that time muslims too quite easily accepted this bifurcation as for them to speaking hindi became synonymous with the servitude of hindus it is language which is used here to marginalize and politically designate a large community of indian population urdu and everything related to it is relegated to margins and viewed as strongly suspicious to national integrity and security there is a lot of chaos surrounding the languages and it is essential to be aware of this chaos that threatens language resorting to the idiom of violence and absurdity in languages is a recent development and at one point eloquence and respectability respectability in the use of language formed the edifice of relationship between language and politics in one of his essays uh, uh, entitled humanist roots of linguistic nationalism alan patton patton discusses about the selective retrieval of a pre specific pre-modern conception of language at the threshold of modernity that which is later adapted to contemporary circumstances 
This included the promotion of national language and its use in important domains of communication by all members of the community. The point, however, is not the polemic behind the promotion of a particular language. Rather, the means through which it is promoted and the use it is subjected to in the process of promotion. Roman statesmen too called for the revival of Latin for specific political reasons. At the same time, they ensured it suffers no mutation and abuse. Language for them is one of the greatest assets, so much so that, that the greatest achievements of the Romans were cultural and linguistic rather than military or political. Dubele suggested that Rome's language was ultimately a more effective, more effective and glorious kind of fortification than all its bindings and palaces. Cicero too attached a lot of significance to eloquence, speech and persuasion in the formation of nation states and instilling patriotism. It is as indispensable. Talks about elegance in terms of careful and tasteful choice of words, which he calls refined diction. Cicero says, someone who has truly mastered Latin would never make error in this. A typical failure of elegance might consist in the indiscriminate use of a common or vulgar word where a refined and precisely calibrated word might be selected instead. Thus, the use of vulgarized diction is an aberration from the stipulated form of dic diction to be ideally used in public addresses. So you can see how much importance and relevance Romans do attach to the usage of language and the elegance aspect in it. The linguist later observed that with the passage of time, the quality of Latin in Roman had deteriorated. Its use in politics for persuasive effect, eloquence, taste and elegance is taken particularly for granted. Its use for glorification of public image of political leaders and displaying their achievements was in turn making it deglorified. Their society faced a crisis of eloquence, one that was grounded. Two more minutes, please. Yes, sir. I'll just wind up. Uh, it's essential to acknowledge that there, um, in order to cure a problem, it is essential to acknowledge that there exists a problem, and this remains one of the major challenges in the Indian scenario. Instead of making substantial changes. They devise strategies to capitalize on such practices for their political purposes. The first step here is to acknowledge that Indian society too is facing a crisis of eloquence. And this needs to be treated with substantial amounts, amount of seriousness. As this would help not only the generations to come, but also the political practitioners who want to get memorialized. Ancients were made immortal not just by their glorious deeds, but also by the power of the po poetic style in which their deeds were memorialized. At last, I would like to say that. Uh, the abuse Hindi is subjected to in its reduction to a mere tool for personalized mobilization foreshadows a lot of dangers in terms of preserving cultural legacy and the damage to the language. Now, this does not mean transforming Hindi or any language for that matter into some kind of theology or a sacred entity or making it more strict or regularized. Nor does it hint at the moral imperative explicitly involved. It is about improving the elegance aspect in it, treating languages with more respect and sensitivity, greater ornamentation and politeness towards language and embellishing it with tasteful choice of words. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. A very well crafted paper talking about language, politics, and the politics of language. Uh, well supported by textual and theoretical evidences. So now the house is open for questions. So, anybody having any question, they can address it to Monica. Uh, questions will be at the end. We are right. Okay. So we can move to the second speaker. Yes. Right, sir. So our second speaker is Ms. Suchentra Banerjee. Uh, she will be talking about retracing cultural contacts, contacts the case of Parsi theatre in India. So, Madam, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a little change in the title uh, from what I had proposed right in the beginning. The paper now reads Retracing Cultural Conversations. And uh, I'm trying to read Pandit Narayan Prasad Betab's Mahabharat in the context of Parsi theater in India. So the title suggests reading Betab's Mahabharat in the context of Parsi theater. This paper tries to understand 
the essence of plurality and cross-cultural contact at the heart of Indian performative traditions through the phenomenon of Parsi theater in India. In 1913, the Mahabharata was performed by one of the Parsi theater companies, the Alfred Theatrical. It was scripted by Pandit Narayan Prasad Veda, who was then an employee of the company. Debates around this production took on epic proportions, confirming the popular wisdom that performing the Mahabharata in itself leads to violent conflict. A long list of objections to the play were published, with Betap responding to each one in print. Most of the controversy focused on Betap's interpolation of scenes that preach against the exclusionary treatment of Dalits, using a term that is familiar today. Betap created not one, but three low caste characters, each of whom conveyed same radical teaching in the offering of bhakti, voicing the belief that all ranks are equal in, rich, in ritual status. This analysis seeks to understand the ways in which Betab's interpretation aims to construct a new narrative and points at prior forms which were renegotiated within the terms of the present. Enactments of Parsi theatre may be examined as a confluence of multiple traditions which is born out of conversations between diverse cultures. My purpose is to argue that Betab's Mahabharat is not meant to propagate Hindutva, but rather to reinterpret the epic within the notion of Hinduism as an expression of nationalism in 1913. Within this frame, Betab advances an ethically motivated agenda in which the national subject is identified principally with the righteous women and Dalits, and only secondarily with the compromised warriors who purportedly are the epic's heroes. The phrase Parsi theater not only includes the playhouses built and operated by actors, but even playwrights and actors who were not Parsis, who worked on salaried basis for the companies. Considerable cross-regional and cross-linguistic movement of artists and writers led to a heterogeneous mix at a broadly national level. Credited to be India's first modern commercial theatre, Parsi theatre was highly influential from 1850s till the 1930s and was a combination of European techniques, spectacle and local forms. By the 1890s, they employed salaried dramatists and actors, built their own playhouses and printed their scripts. Parsi companies inspired theatres virtually in every corner of India and perhaps created the largest ticket buying audience in Indian stage history. By 1900, Parsi theatre troops had started in Karachi, Lahore, Jodhpur, Agra, Aligarh, Mirat, Lucknow and Hyderabad. Parsi theatre companies had developed a unique form which was highly eclectic taking stories from Shah Nama, Mahabharat, Arabian Nights, Shakespeare's tragedies and comedies, and of course, Victorian melodramas. Its style was adopted from English amateur theatricals, British touring repertoires, European realistic narrative structures, the singing and performing traditions of 19th century Indian courtesans, and visual treatment of Indian artist Raja Ravi Varma. Perial Shakespearean adaptations were staged. Ahsan's Khun and Naka, which was produced in 1898 from Hamlet, Shahi Devafa from Othello, Dil Farosh from Merchant of Venice, Hashar, Hashar's Safed Khun from King Lear, Betab's Gorak Dhanda from Comedy of Errors. But fairies, princes, devils, and wizards from Islamic tales became more popular than English spirits and ghosts, and hugely successful plays were presented on the stages of Parsi theatre. These included Indra Sabha or Indra's court, Gul Bakhtiwali, Laila Majnu, and Sharil Farhad, in numerous versions, were very popular. Indra Sabha, written by Saeed Aga Hassan, known as Amanat, first stage in 1853, had earned a degree of fame, which was phenomenal, and so was Betab's Mahabharat. Apart from Mahabharat, the Parsi theatrical companies also produced Ramayana, Shravan Kumar, Kathavachak's Veer Abhimanyu, Talib's Ram Leela, to compete with the then growing popularity of Hindu Sangeet Nata in Marathi theatre. Coming to Ketab's Mahabharata, 
Betaab, in his autobiography, Betaab Charit, writes this, and this is very important for you to know. And I'm quoting from Betaab Charit. Finally, after numerous difficulties, the moment we had been awaiting arrived. A date was fixed for the debut in the Sangam Theater in Delhi. Just then, a well-wisher approached Seth Khatua and told him that Mahabharat was never recited in an inhibited area. If it was, it led to inauspicious consequences. <coughs> After the initial shock, I came to my senses and responded, Sejji, what people say is true. Whatever the Mahabharat, wherever the Mahabharat is performed, that place becomes Kurukshetra, a field of battle. But if the preliminary rituals prescribed by the rishis are scrupulously observed, there is none of that. In fact, the outcome is beneficial and profitable. Thousands of rupees had already been invested in the production. There was no way of getting that sum back except through the ritual. I explained the procedure to follow. The playhouse was first purified and then a havan ceremony was performed. A ritual feast was offered to the Brahmins. Once the Brahmins' blessing was secured, said Katua was not the man he had been the day before. Auspicious resolve made his fearful mind strong and firm again. Mm -hmm. The gates of the Alfred Company were decorated with banners and it welcomed everyone." Unquote. This experiment was a huge monetary triumph for the Parsi Alfred Company. Betav's Mahabharat was performed three times a week for several years in towns across North India. Critics hailed it, declaring that Betav had turned the stage around, produced a revolution in the theatre world, giving notice, given notice to Hindu, uh, Hindu plays to vacate the stage, and performed valuable service to the spread of Parsi theatre. As mentioned earlier, the debate around Betab's Mahabharat revolved around the interpolations of the scenes, which essentially espoused the philosophy of Nirgun Bhakti through the characters who are Dalit. Draupadi and Krishna become the defenders of Dalits and expound the Nirgun form of worship. Against the opposition of Drona and Duryodhan, they argue for the rights of the Chamars to perform rituals, sing bhajans, and express their faith. There is a powerful epiphany by Ganga in the play who expresses reasons to protect the Chamars and the ritual items. Finally, Dron abandons his stubborn defiance of Brahmanical superiority and is ready to offer obeisance at the feet of Cheta Chaman. The structure of Betab's plays is reducible to three elements. One, the central story, Two, the invented episode, three, song, dances, spectacles, and other attractions. Betab follows Vyasa's narrative rather faithfully, but in a highly compressed fashion. Act one takes place in the palaces of Pandavas and Kauravas. Act two moves briefly to the jungle and then to the battlefield. And act three, after several battle scenes, the drama ends in hell and heaven. The most fully developed scene is the sabha in the gambling hall placed at the end of act one. The battle scenes are shot and full of action. Betab's procedure of selection is outlined in a preliminary scene composed in the form of conventional dialogue between the Sutradhar and his assistant, the Nati. Here, the Sutradhar notes that it would require at least 18 days to recount the 18 parvas of the Mahabharata. Therefore, the Nati should instruct the players to leave aside the branches, shakha, and only go along the main path, marg, the Sutradhar goes on to the foreground to foreground the kernel of Mahabharata's teaching, stressing the relevance for today's audience. Bharat was once full of great warriors, but now the people lie sleeping, heedless and neglectful. Those who were brave have become cowards, the wise ones are ignorant. They have even forgotten of which father they were, they are the offspring. All of this came about because they forsook dharma, karma and Sharam. The didactic purpose of Mahabharata in this time is thus set forth. Like a bridge across the sea, it will help India to cross the troubled waters. In the swiftly moving narrative that Beta crafts, Dharma and Karma are shown of their ambiguities and become simple matters. Draupadi insults Duryodhan when he falls into an illusory pond, calling him the son of blind man, and her deed sets in motion a course of retribution demonstrating the law of karma. 
Dhritarashtra knows that gambling is immoral, but he ignores dharma and consent to the gambling, bringing on destruction. To the age-old combination of dharma and karma, Vedab conjoins shun, honor, and modesty, most palpably demonstrated through the public humiliation of Draupadi. Dragged into the sabha by Dush, Dushashan, Draupadi's cries for aid fail to rouse the Pandavas, shamed though they are by her exposure. If the Pandavas, through their errors, incurred the suffering that follows, it is nonetheless Duryodhan, who is the essence of Adharma. His overweening jealousy, cruelty, hatred, and vindictiveness combine to create the classic villain. Duryodhan's character comes into focus through two contrasts. His father, Dhritarashtra, although aware of Dhan, is easily swayed and agrees with whatever position is presented to him. His constant repetition of the phrase, Yehi mein bhi kehta ho, expresses his vacillation, and he becomes a source of comedy and ridicule. The Pandavas, for their part, are rather shadowy figures, with the exception of Bhim in the battle. They too set off Duryodhan's forceful nature. Draupadi, on the other hand, is a blazing presence of dominating, the blazing presence dominating many scenes. Her impassioned resistance to Duryodhan is the complete opposite of Western melodramas, damsel in distress. She says, my entire body burns with the fire of insult, and my very pores emit sparks. In the newly invented episode occupying almost 50% of the drama, Draupadi takes on three notable aspects. As mouthpiece of Pavitra Dharma, as spiritual sister of Krishna, and as champion of the Chamars. Both Draupadi and Krishna take on a further dimension in five scenes nested within Act 2. In the first, a character named Nandanai is introduced. The barber's daily task is to massage the feet of Duryodhan. Nandanai is a superlative devotee of Krishna. When two sadhus seeking a meal come to pay him their respect, he postpones his attendance upon Duryodhan, seeing sadhu seva as a higher obligation. Krishna, bound by Nanda's devotion, disguises himself as Nanda and goes to Duryodhan in his place, thus sparing Nanda Duryodhan's wrath. As he transformed into a low caste nai, Krishna declares that nothing is amiss. He would gladly become even a bhangi if he had. The next scene set in Duryodhan's bedchamber begins with a comedy of mistaken identities. Krishna, disguised as Nanda, massages Duryodhan and departs. The real Nanda shows up, apologizing until he realizes that Krishna, the supreme being, has just attended upon Duryodhan. When Nanda praises his Ishtadev, Duryodhan denies Krishna's divinity and starts to beat Nanda. The scene ends with two miracles. First, Vishnu's Viman comes down from heaven and rescues Nanda. The Kauravas express disgust that the Shudra, a lowly Nai, has been taken to heaven. Then Krishna, as emissary of the Pandavas, appeared, but Duryodhan refu refuses to sign the treaty he offers. Duryodhan attacks Krishna, and Krishna reveals his cosmic form, exploding through the palace walls in myriad manifestations. In this scene, the villainous Duryodhan refuses to accept both the exalted status of the lowly devotee Nanda and the revelation that Krishna is God. His stubbornness continues into the final scene where he confronts Cheta Chamal. The third scene dramatizes, a, dramatizes an episode in which Draupadi figures prominently as the Chamal's defender. The scene focuses on the character named Seva, the son of Cheta Chamal, who wishes to take water from the high caste well from his, for his evening rich, rituals. He is opposed by Shanta, the daughter of Drona. Drona, of course, is a Brahmin and a notorious enforcer of Brahminical privilege. As seen in the Ekalavya episode, which is not included in Vedav's text, Shanta utters some nasty curses and threatens to send Seva packing until Draupadi enters and sides with Seva. Draupadi presents a learned exposition on the accessibility of the formless god, arguing that to worship this being is not dependent upon birth. And she says, Bhala nirakar nirle or ek ras ishwar ka bhajan karna kya si ki morasi jagir hai. Finally, Shanta, won over to Draupadi's position, apologizes for her mistake and leaves. In the scene immediately following, Drona instructs his daughter Shanta to perform the evening arti. Shanta, decently converted by Draupadi, rejects the idea of image worship in a lengthy song. Krishna, breaking through the wall again, manifests as the four armed god. To his new devotee. Drona returns, and Drona and Krishna enter into a lengthy debate. Krishna describes himself as formless and shapeless, 
but visible to all who love him. He says that he has just come from the house of Seva, a Chamal, where he ate Khichri, proving that the devotion of Dalits is, accept is accepted by God. Despite Krishna's exhortations, Drona is unconvinced and vows to catch the Chamal, fearing a reversal of caste hierarchy if they are not stopped. The last scene and my last example in the second act provides a climactic and spectacular conclusion to this debate. Tensions grow as Sheta Chamar enters with his group of followers singing praise in the name of Ram and carrying ritual items for Thakur Puja. Duryodhan and Drona combine forces against them once more. There is a prolonged philosophical exchange with Cheta arguing that Bhakti is open to everyone, including women, Shudras and Apishudras. Drona orders Cheta to throw his Simhasan into the river, but Cheta challenges him, saying that this act will only prove his devotion. The Simhasan refuses to sink while Cheta prays, inviting it to come to him. A huge wave arises. Upon it is seated a mugger or a crocodile, and on the mugger's back is the goddess Ganga holding the Simhasan. Drona once more enters into a philosophical debate, this time with Ganga asking the goddess to explain why she did not heed his prayer as a Brahmin, but instead responds to the Chamal. Ganga states that his imperfect enlightenment was due to the errors of his ancestors and his false and the faulty samskars. Drona, now repentant, is ready to touch his head to Cheta's feet. But suddenly, Ganga says, no, it is not necessary. She reveals that Cheta is really a Brahmin, a disciple of Ramanand, who was disguised as a Chamar, as a guest. She pierces Cheta's chest, and the sacred thread is revealed. The scene ends on this tableau. Readers may recognize that Cheta's story is actually that of the North Indian saint poet Raidas or Ravidas, who was also a Chamar. Many mem members of Betab's audience would surely have made this identification. Lower caste groups began to follow the Nirgun Bhakti of sons like Kabir and Raidas from the 15th century. In the early 20th century, untouchable groups in the Punjab and United Province turned towards heterodox devotionalism in large numbers. Mark Eugensmeyer has chronicled the collations of Chamars in Punjab around Ravidas. Yes, give me two more minutes an establishment of ad dharm founded in 1926 by manguram as a breakaway faction from the arya samaj the outlines of raidas's career and his intimate tie to the chamar community circulated among betab spectators by the means of both oral and written accounts the life story of raidas was contained in the textual sources such as bhaktamal and subsequent hagiographies these were disseminated through the agency of kathavachaks a professional raconteurs Raidas's autobiography was also preserved within his utterances of Vani, which have come down in both Hindi, Hindi and Punjabi tra traditions. The Raidas story is dramatized, a series of contests between orthodox Brahmins and Chamar devotees, as do the scenes constructed by Deta. The display of miraculous powers, such as the summoning of Simhasan to the riverbank, is a central motive in these tales. So too is the special relationship between Raidas and Goddess Ganga, whereby Raidas asserts his power over the goddess through the intensity of his devotion and she becomes his protector. The hagiographies like Betab's texts culminate in the revelation of the sacred thread within Raidas's chest, and they assert that Raidas was Ramanandi, although that this is questioned by many scholars today. Why was why has Betab drafted Raidas's story onto his Mahabharat? Clearly, this is a shaka not part of the main mark. Returning, I think I'll just conclude here. What were then Betab's ideological sources? His frequent visits to Punjab, especially Lahore, were more likely the catalyst of what appears to be his conversation around 1911 to Arya Samaj teaching. While his theater company was resident in Karachi, Betab and a colleague established a home study circle where he expounded the Satyarth Prakash every afternoon. Embracing the ideal of a self-reform, he and few friends took a public vow to tell the truth. This Betab exhibited by permanently adopting an awkward turban and, shoulder and a shoulder cloth, the uniform of a holy warrior. Each day, the small circle of truth seers evaluated their moral progress, and according to Betab, his own metamorphosis was most dramatic. 
Around the same time Beta began casting his Mahabharat for the stage, it is possible that the text was suggested by his study of Dayan and Saraswati's. Dayanam had found the key to the present degeneracy of Hinduism in Mahabharat and traced the extinction of Vedic knowledge and religion to the Great War. The Mahabharat thus explained the present state of Bharat and could be used to redeem it. The enactment of Nirgun Bhakti by the Chamars nested within the heart of the play goes even further toward imagining the nation as an inclusive and integrated community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. It was a very good re-illustration of the ancient epic Mahabharat in terms of Pandit Narayan Prasad Beta. Probably he found a very suitable and a politically correct tool to solve the issue of casteism in India, especially bringing forth the Dalits, the Chamars, etc., becoming the uh, central characters, having a lot of importance and their importance being uh, um, uh, supported by gods and goddesses also, as you suggested that Ganga is there. <clears throat> so a very beautiful paper. Uh, now we'll move to our third participant, uh, third presenter, that is uh, Saida Sarkatul Mola Al Qadri. And this present, uh, the topic of the presentation is Amir Khusro, Ganga Jamni Tehjib Ke Alam, Alam Barda. So all yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good. मेरा नाम सैयद अशारक मौला अल कादरी मैं गवर्नमेंट गर्ल्स जनरल डिग्री कॉलेज इकबालपुर कलकत्ता की प्रिंसिपल हूँ मेरा टॉपिक है अमीर खुसरो गंगा जमनी तहजीब के अलमबरदार इंसानी तहजीब और तमदन की तारीख में सैकड़ों नाम ऐसे मिलेंगे जिन्होंने अपनी काबिलियत से अपना नाम हमेशा के लिए जरीद आलम पर सब कर दिया इन लोगों ने अपने जज्बे ईजाद के बल पर अपने हम असरों पर ही नहीं बल्कि हर जमाने में फोकियत हासिल की ऐसे ही जामे शख्सियत अबुल हसन अमीनुद्दीन खुसरो की भी है यमीनुद्दीन खुसरो की भी है हजरत अमीर खुसरो का शुमार फारसी और उर्दू के अजीम उलमरतबत अदीबों और शायरों में होता है वो कसर उलजहाद शख्सियत के मालिक थे उनको मुख्तलिफ उलूम फनून पर आमिलाना दस्तरस्त हासिल की वो बैक वक्त आलम बामल सूफी बामाल अजीम शायर मुफक्र फलसफी बेमिसाल मौसीकार और अदीब कामिल थे उर्दू जबान अदब के पहले शायर भी तस्लीम किए जाते हैं उन्होंने अपनी फिक्र फन और खुदादात सलाहियत से अपने अहद को बड़ा मुतासर किया आज भी लोग इनकी शख्सियत और शायरी के मद्दा हैं मौलाना शिबली नोमानी अमीर खुसरो की जामिया कमालत पर तबसरा करते हुए कहते हैं कि हिंदुस्तान में 600 बरस में अब तक इस दर्जे का जाम कमालत नहीं पैदा हुआ और सच पूछो तो इस कदर गुनागो अस्ताफ के जामे ईरान और रूम के खाक ने भी हजारों बरस की मुद्दत में दो चार ही पैदा किए होंगे खुसरो फारसी उर्दू और रायजुल वक्त जबानों में दस्तगाह रखते थे उन्होंने अपने वक्त की पांच जबानों पर महारत हासिल की खुसरो का मौलिक पटियाली था जहाँ की जबान मिर्ज भाषा थी लेकिन खुसरो अपनी जबान को हिंदवी कहते हैं कमाल में कहते हैं कि तुर्क हिंदुस्तानी मन हिंदवी गोयन चुनाव मैं हिंदुस्तानी तुर्क हूँ और हिंदवी पानी की तरह बोलता हूँ उर्दू और हिंदवी के अलावा उन्होंने फारसी में भी कमो बेश लाख तखलीक किए हैं पांच लाख अशार तखलीक किए हैं गजल आपके महबूब सिंफ सुखन की मगर उन्होंने दूसरे औसाफ सुखन में भी तबाह आजमाई की है और कई अहम तसानी अपनी यादगार छोड़ी हैं जो फारसी उर्दू और हिंदी जबान का कदीम अनमोल अदबी खजाना माना जाता है अमीर खुसरो हजरत निजामुद्दीन औलिया के दस्त गिरफ्तार मुरीद थे हजरत ने अमीर खुसरो को खास तरबियत से नवाजा और उनको तस्वुर के रंग में इस तरह रंग दिया कि उनकी शायरी और उनका हर फेल अल्लाह और अपने महबूब की रमोशत की रजाजुई के लिए होता है ये शेख की तालीम और तरबियत और निगाहदाश्त का असर था कि अमीर खुसरो तालीम और तरबियत अखलाक हसना जहद तकवा और दूसरे उलूम में कामिल बन गए और उन्होंने अपनी सारी जिंदगी जोदो तकवा और खिदमत खल्क में गुजारी 
اپنے بارے میں خود کہتے ہیں کہ کافر اشپم مسلمانی مرا درکار نیست ہر رگی من تار گشتا حاج سے زمنار نیست انہوں نے اپنے کلام میں بھٹکی ہوئی انسانیت کو راہ راست پر لانے کی کوشش کی ہے جس کے خاطر جس کا خاطر کا نتیجہ برآمد ہوا ہے ان کی تعلیمات سے انسانیت کا درس ملتا ہے ان کی تعلیمات اور ان کا پیغام آپسی بھائی چارہ خدمت خل اور محبت کو عام کرتا ہے کہتے ہیں کہ نزدیک اہل بھی نش کو رست اور بے شک آشیہ کے پیش چشمش زنگی سنم نباشن حضرت امیر خسرو نے ادب اور شاعری کے علاوہ سماجی زندگی میں مشترکہ روایات اور جذبات اور ہم آہنگی کو فروغ دینے میں بھی اہم رول ادا کیا ہے وہ اپنی خوش مزاجی فراغ دلی اور ملنسار طبیعت کی وجہ سے اپنے زمانے میں ہر دل عزیز تھے وہ لوگوں کے دلوں کو موہ لینے کا فن جانتے تھے انہیں معلوم تھا کہ کس شخص سے کس طرح بات کی جائے تاکہ سامنے کی رسائی گفتگو کے روح تک ہو ان کی باتوں سے اور ان کی شاعری سے بچے بوڑھے امیر غریب مرد عورت شہری دیہاتی ہندو مسلم غلط کے ہر کوئی متفق تھا عوام الناس میں جو شہرت انہیں حاصل تھی وہ ان کی ہندی کلام کی وجہ سے بھی تھی انہوں نے ہندی شاعری کو فارسی بہور و اوزان کا لباس ادا کیا اور ان کے اشعار کے مطالعے سے یہ اندازہ ہوتا ہے کہ دو کلچر ایک دوسرے کے گلے مل رہے ہیں ان دونوں زبانوں کی آمیزش کو اردو کے شاعروں نے رختہ کا نام دیا ہے ان کی شاعری کی کچن اشار ملاحظہ فرمائے زہال مسکی مکن تغافل درائے مینا بنائے بتیاں کتاب ہجرا ندار میجا نہ لے ہوکاہے لگائے چھتیاں امیر خسرو نے ہندوستان کی سرزمین پر سب سے پہلے سماجی رواداری بھائی چارگی اور آپسی ملاب کے ورثے کو شاعری اظہار ورثے کو شاعرانہ اظہار کا ذریعہ بنایا ان کا فطری رجحان ہمیشہ ہندوستانی سماج کی ہندی ہندو روایت اور مسلمانی معاشرے کی اسلامی خصوصیات میں اشتراک قائم کرنے کی طرف اس کا ثبوت ان کی پہلیاں کہ مکرمیاں ان میلیاں اور دو سخنوں میں ملتا ہے مثال کے طور پر مندر زین پہلی میں دو قوموں کا ذکر کرتے ہوئے کہتے ہیں کہ گھوم گھمیلا لہگا پہنے ایک گاؤں پر رہے کڑی آٹھ ہاتھ ہے اس ناری کے صورت اس کے لگے پری سب کوئی اس کی چارہ کریں مسلمان ہندو چھتری خسرو نے کہ کہی پہلی دل سے اپنے سوچ دری ان کے دوہے بھی پہلیوں کی طرح گنگا جمنی تہذیب کے نمائندگی کرتے ہیں کہتے ہیں کہ خسرو پاتی پریم کی پرلا بانجھے کوئے وید قرآن اتھی پڑے پریم بنا پریم بنا کا ہوئے اچھا ان کے دوہے جہاں ان کی جذبات اور دلی کیفیات کے ترجمان ہیں وہی ہندوستانی سماج کے مروجہ رسومات اور ریت رواج کی اکاسی بھی کرتے ہیں مثلا مندر زیل دوہا میں ستی کے رواج کو اس انداز سے بیان کرتے ہیں کہ خسرو ایسی پریت کر جیسے ہندو جوئے سوٹ پرائے کار نے جل جل کوئلہ ہوئے ان کے دوہوں کی طرح ان کی کہ مکرمیاں بھی عوام میں بہت مقبول ہیں جن میں کچھ ایسی بھی ہیں جن میں جا بجا الفاظ کا استعمال کیا گیا ہے جو اس بات کا ثبوت ہیں کہ آپ کے اندر مذہبی بھید باؤ بالکل بھی نہیں تھا کہتے ہیں کہ آٹھ انگل کا ہے وہ اصلی اس کی ہڈی نہ اس کی پسلی لٹ دھاری پرو کا چیلا اے سکی ساجن نہ سکی کیلا پھر کہتے ہیں شام برن اور دانت انیک لچکت جیسے ناری دونوں ہاتھ سے خسرو کھینچے اور یوں کہے انا آری اسی زمین میں خسرو کا وہ واقعہ بھی قابل ذکر ہے کہ حضرت علامتین اولیاء اپنے بھانجے تقیبین کے انتقال کے بعد بہت غمگین رہنے لگے تھے جن سے وہ بہت محبت کرتے تھے امیر خسرو سے آپ کی یہ حالت دیکھی نہیں گئی ایک دن خسرو رستے سے گزر رہے تھے انہوں نے دیکھا کہ کچھ ہندو ڈھول اور منجرہ لیے برتن کی لباس پہنے سرسوں کا پھول ہاتھ میں لیے گاتے بجاتے جا رہے ہیں 
ससुरन ने उनसे पूछा कि कहाँ जा रहे हैं उन्होंने जवाब दिया कि आज बसंत का त्योहार है और अपने खुदा को सरसों के फूल का तोहफा पेश करने जा रहा हूँ पाल का मंदिर जा रहा हूँ खुसरों ने ये खुसरों को ये अंदाज बेहद पसंद आया और उन्होंने ये सोचा कि वो भी अपने पुरुषित के अपने महबूब को इसी तरह का तोहफा पेश करेंगे उन्होंने बसंती लिबास पहना और चंद मुरीदों को साथ लेकर हजरत की खानका पर बसंत के गीत गाते हुए पहुंचे हजरत निजामुद्दीन के चारों तरफ तवाफ करने लगे और मुरीद उनके कदमों पर सरसों के फूल बिछावर करने लगे हजर निजामुद्दीन उनकी इस हरकत को देखकर मुस्तरा पड़े ये त्योहार आज तक अमीर खुसरो की याद में मनाया जाता है और हजरत निजामुद्दीन के मजार पर हजरत निजामुद्दीन और के मजार पर हर साल बसंती कपड़े पहने फूलों का सरसों के फूलों का थाल लिए हिंदू काफी कसीर तादाद में मजार पर आते हैं और बसंत का त्योहार मनाते हैं ये त्योहार हिंदू मुस्लिम यकजहती की एक बेहतरीन मिसाल है अमीर खुसरो की पहलियां यह मुकदमिया और अनमेलियों की तरह पारसी कलाम में भी सामाजिक रवादारी जलवा नुमा है सामाजिक रवादारी की बेहतरीन मिसाल अमीर खुसरो के इन चंद अशार में है जिसमें अमीर खुसरो ने सती के रस्म और रिवाज के बारे में कहा है अपने कलाम में जब जो इसका जिक्र किया है कहते हैं कि दर इश्क बाजी कम हिंदू जन मबाश तज तराए मुर्दमी सुजंद जाने खेसरा फिर दूसरी जगह कहते हैं कि चुन जने हिंदू कसी दर आशकी दीवाना नीस सोख तन बर्शम में मुर्दा कारे हर परवाना नीस तो इससे अमीर खुसरो की सामाजिक रवादारी और यकजहती का नमूना हम लोगों को मिलता है अलगज खुसरो को हिंदुस्तान में गंगा जमनी तहजीब के नुमाइंदा शायर का मकाम हासिल है आप अदबी दुनिया के वो दरक्षंदा सितारे हैं जिन्होंने सात सौ अड़सठ साल कबल इस दुनिया में अपना इस दुनिया से अपना नाता जोड़ा और वो नाता इतना मजबूत था कि आज भी दायम कायम है इनका सिर्फ कलाम ही गंगा जमनी तहजीब का अलम बरदार नहीं है बल्कि इनके मजार पर पर भी बिला तफरी मजहब मिलत लोग हाजिर होते हैं और फैजियाब होते हैं शुक्रिया थैंक यू मिस अलकादिक फॉर दिस ब्यूटीफुल रिफ्लेक्शन ऑन द पोइट्री ऑफ अमीर खुसरो एंड द कल्चरल पुलरिटी व्हिच इट एक्सप्रेसेस थ्रू इट्स वॉल्यूमिनस कंपोजिशंस एंड इट्स रिलेशन विद हजरत निजामुद्दीन औलिया एंड द अदर एस्पेक्ट्स सो नाउ आई थिंक दैट द हाउस इज ओपन फॉर क्वेश्चंस सो मिल address questions one by one so we can start with the questions for the first presenter uh, that was uh, ms monica chaudhary so any questions for her, her paper i repeat the title of the paper the splintering of linguistic plurality marginalization of urdu and abuse of hindi in indian linguistic landscape Yes. Any anyone having any question? I think that there is. Can I last session for this table? Sure. Uh, any questions for uh, uh, Ms. Banerjee on her paper about the Parsi theater and the adaptation of Namarat in Parsi by Parsi theater? Uh, any questions for Ms. Al Qadri on Amir Khusro? So I don't think that there is any question. So we had a very wonderful session today. All three of you were wonderful in your own ways. Um, so congratulations to all three of you. Thank you so much. We'll conclude now.
Thank you, sir. And uh, we are heading towards our next session. And uh, uh, the chair of the next session, <laughs> Professor Amitabha Chakravarti, is already with us. Wait. Professor Amitabha Chakravarti teaches Bengali and Comparative Indian Literature at the Department of Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, University of Delhi. He has taught at Tripura University and Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. His specialization uh, area is uh, literary and cultural theory, and he has several publications on postmodernism, Uttar Adhunikatabad, and the Swarajish paradigm. He has published Bengali and English poetry and Bengali and English translation from Assamese, Japanese, and Tamil. He is the founder general secretary of the International Society of Bengal Studies. He has received various awards, including Swadhana Vattacharya Research Award, International Society for the History of Rhetoric Fellowship, and Maiman Shingha Gitika Centenary Honor. We welcome you, sir. Uh, please start the session and uh, introduce the paper presenters to us. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, we are already late. So, I'll just uh, start by saying that um, we'll, we have 60 minutes, but I and I think uh, we'll take our 60 minutes even if the we have started late. So uh, we have three speakers here. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes. I'll remind you after 12 minutes so that you can conclude so that we have some time for discussion, even if not questions. Uh, as we are taking questions at the end, I'll request participants, uh, if possible, to keep on posting their questions on, in the chat box so that uh, whoever uh, presents can look at the questions beforehand and have an idea about how to what to say. And of course, at the end, if there is no question in the chat box, we'll open it for discussion. So our first presenter today is Romila Vishwas. Vishwas. Romila is a MA student at the, in the Department of Comparative Indian Languages and Literature, University of Calcutta. And she will be talking about reception of Omar Khayyam in Bengali, a survey on translation. Yes, Romila, the floor is yours now. Uh, good afternoon, honorable professors and other participants. <clears throat> I'm very thankful to the Comparative Literature Association of India for giving me such opportunity to present my very first paper on such a big platform. So I'm starting my paper. So my paper was on our reception of Omar Khayyam in Bengali, a survey on translation. The concept of translation in India differs from the models and idea of translation theories followed in the Western countries. Unlike Western translators, Indian translators enjoy the freedom of rewriting and retailing of the source language text into the target language text. Deconstruction and reconstruction play important roles in Indian concept of translation. His paper tries to analyze the translations of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat by Kanti Chandra Ghosh and Sultan Muhammad Raja from the translated work of Edward Fitzgerald's Fitzgerald. Uh, highlighting the Indian concept of translation. It also explores the translation of uh, Baji Nasrul Islam and Shukti Chattavanta. Omar Khayyam's portraits had been translated in different languages in different times, but the popularity of his portraits never ceased for once. Kanti Chandra Ghosh translated Rubaiyat from Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam under the title Rubaiyat in Omar Khayyam in the year 1929. In the introduction of the book, Rabindranath Tagore elucidated the difficulties of translation from one language to another while praising the Torjuma of Kantachandra. Torjuma stands for the Bengali term of adaptation of other as our own. Translation does not only constitute the changing of the text from the one language to another, rather creates a bridge of communication between the cultures of the source language text and the target language text. <coughs> so, the Kantachandra Ghosh followed the flow of Hidzirat and did not change the lines particularly. His work was a literal word to word translation, but it did not hamper the sense that Kanti Chandra intended to relay from the point of view of a Bengali mind. As Rubinet Tagore pointed, Kanti Chandra created his own Rubaiyat by taking the essence of the Fitzgerald's version and enriching Torjama defines the recreation of text by inducing the rasa of the source text into the new one. Though Kanti's Torjama is a parallel translation of the source text, uh, it did not fail to express the simple yet lucid flow of the Bengali poet. This made the translation more of a Bengali in nature, since Fitzgerald oh, no. created the Persian oh, no. portraits as his own and Ghosh translated it from him. Kanti's version lacks the sense of Persian culture and ambience. 
but the philosophy and central idea of Omar Khayyam remained untapped. Sultan Muhammad Rajak of Bangladesh too translated Rubaiyat from Fitzgerald's book of Umar Khayyam in 2020. Now the question arises, what made him translate the quatrains of Umar Khayyam, which had already been translated many times in Bengali before him? Sultan answered these questions in the introduction of his book. He felt that he had always found the mind of poet Umar Khayyam, who was a philosopher and a mathematician from the translation of Fitzgerald, but the taste lacked in the translations of other Bengali translators. He felt that the Bengali translators had gone too far with their own imagination and poetic sense, leaving the sense of Fitzgerald behind. He also believed that classic literature, especially poetry translation, which are as old as a thousand years, even the sense, language, and philosophy of the poet should be translated in modern languages. Sultan's translation is naturally more modern than the language that he used is practiced by modern day Bengalis. They do not contain the 21st century melody, but do not lack the melody and poetic essence at all. Thus, the modern readers of 21st century do not find <coughs> Sultan's version of Rubaiyat any less than the others. Sultan quoted, Fitzgerald's translation is rhyming and metrical and rather free. Many of the verses are paraphrased and to a large extent, the Rubaiyat can be considered original poetry by Fitzgerald loosely based on Umar Khayyam. Commerce portraits rather than a translation in the narrow sense. This marks the age old practice of Indian mm -hmm. translation and the reader's attitude toward the translators. The predominance of oral tradition in India naturally brings, brings out the tendencies of transcreation of the original text. This led to the linguistic and thematic stewardies taken by the translators, but this never reduced the importance of the new versions. As K. Sachidanandan observed, the original has never been specially privileged and the translator's position has never been secondary in India. Intertextuality is a significant feature of transcreation. Hence, when a reader goes through the translations of the same portraits by different translations, the new portraits thus formed come out as different ones, keeping the original content unchanged. The readers do not complain about the similar creations as they are different from each other, for the imagination of the translators are different, making the portraits the creations of their own. As Indrajit Chatterjee said, one can realize that in the Indian context, the term for translation is Anubad, and it signifies the repetition of what is enjoyed by a Vedic text with a different wording. But rep uh, repetition is not understood as a literal word by word rendering of the original from the source to target language. In the Indian context, the reader is never a passive receiver of the text in which the truth is enshrined. According to the theorist of, uh, theories of Rasa and Dhvani, a text is redid, recorded in such a way so that the reader can have multiple aesthetic experience rather than a single invariant reading. Thus, the method of producing a pure text is, uh, as practiced in Europe was an alien notion for Indian. Any deviation from the original text is not treated as translation in Indian translation. If we compare a poem of Fitzgerald translated by both Kanti Chandra Ghosh and uh, Sultan Muhammad Rajak, we can spot the difference in the use of language. For example, <coughs> sorry, in Fitzgerald's poem number five, Iram indeed is gone with all its rows and Jamshid's seven ringed cup where no one knows, but still the vine, her ancient ruby ends, and still a garden by the water blows. Uh, Sultan uses the word bilin, which is means which means resolved for, th for the term gone. Whereas Kanti used paliyache, a literal meaning of gone with or to flee, while translating the same poems. Again, if we take the poem of numbers 26 of Fitzgerald's version, who come with old Khayyam and leave the wise to talk, one thing is certain that life flies. One thing is certain and he, the rest is lies. The flower that once has bloomed forever dies. In this poem, both Ghosh and Sultan show extensive difference in their versions. Sultan used the Persian word Saki for the addressed person, while Ghosh addressed as Bundhu. Language used by Kantri Chandra was, was the one used by the poets for writing purposes and was something not fit for oral conversations. Though Sultan's language too is not very colloquial, it is somewhat close to that. Here stands the freedom of translators to interpret their own imagination and emotion in their own chosen language. In another translation of portraits number one, Kanti uses Raj Prashad, which means king's palace, 
for Sultan's turret and Sultan uses used Sultanir mirror uh, minar chure, which means Sultan's turret. Parallel comp uh, comparison can be drawn from the translations of Kazi Nazrul Islam published in 1958 and Shokti Chattopadhyay published in 1978, as both of them translated from the original Persian text of Umar Khayyam. But their translations show, stri show striking difference from each other. Nazrul's version is rich in his own careful interpretation of Khayyam. In the preface to his book, Nazrul made it clear that he had tried his utmost not to divert from what Khayyam has tried to portray through his, through his portraits. He tried, <coughs> sorry, he had tried to bring out a tinge of a sense of the Middle East ambience. Nazrul was of the opinion that Umar had pinned down in his portraits what he could not enjoy in his real life and has expressed his unfulfilled desire and frustration. He brought the idea of Umar, Umar being an Epicurean. Nazrul felt that Umar's Rubaiyat was an expression of the passionate human, human declining the boundaries of logic and hence is modern in all respects. The translations show, show uh, extensive use of Persian and Urdu words like Khoda, Sharab, Shiraz, Saki, and others. The poems are quite straightforward, revealing an attitude of depression and anger suppressed in mind. Shukta Chotopadhyay, on the contrary, did not mention about Khoyam's philosophy as such, but he confessed his ultimate liberty adopted during his translation. He tried to adapt the culture and environment of these portraits into a very Bengali mindset where Omar's Allah became Ishwar of Bengal. He incorporated Bengal's rivers like Ganges and Kobiruti and flowers besides Persian roses. Written in somewhat a bit complicated Bengali, Chotopadhyay reconstructed Persian time and reconstructed it Bengalish Shundhi Pujo, evening prayer for Hindu Bengalis, and Tooth Moshai, Hindu priest. While translating the same portraits of Iran here, Shokti Chotabhatta used Gachi Kabul Khanai that has, uh, has gone to the graveyard for the word gone. Thus, the same portrait brings out different words that relay somewhat the same meanings. Readers of Bengal have been enjoying Umar Khoyam's Rubaiyat since its first translation. With course of time, the readers have changed their approach have altered and so changed the language of the translated texts. But the philosophy and yearnings for the truth and spiritualism, the frustration for unfulfilled desire, the inner pain and sufferings remain unchanged throughout the ages, making it timeless. Translation keeps this, this sense moving through the ages. Thank you. Thank you, Romila. You have actually concluded within 10 minutes. Thank you. So we'll come back to your presentation and we'll discuss it later. We'll take all the presentations uh, after the, all the three presentations together. So now uh, I'm inviting Srijita Pal to present her paper. Uh, she has a master's degree in English literature from Jadavpur and then MPhil from Christ University, Bangalore. She, is, she has recently submitted her dissertation Title from Abolut to Mehfil on reading colonial Bengali, Bengals, Muslim women writers. Well, yeah. Now she is, uh, this is this program she is doing in the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay and Monash University. Okay. Now she is, uh, she is also the associate editor of Koloku, Text Theory and Critic Journal and the Queer. Okay. Uh, she also sings. I I can't get this word anyway. So okay, uh, she will be presenting on Parsi Arabic tales in translation and women's writing in colonial Bengal, the Hamza Nama, the Arabian Nights, and Faizul Nesa Choudhury's Rup Jala. Yes. Thank you. Yours, Sujita. Thank you, Professor Chakravarti. Since you've already said the title of my paper, let me just jump right in. Um, 1876 saw the publication of two of the earliest women writers' works in colonial Bengal, Faizul Nasa Chodhurani's Rup Chalan and Rashundari Devi's Amar Jibon, My Life. The latter has since been institutionalized and is now widely acknowledged as the first autobiography in Bengali. In contrast, Rup Jalal has remained relegated to relative obscurity. In this paper, I debate demonstrate how approaching Rup Jalal through the lens of Bengali literary modernity renders it invisible, privileging only those kinds of literary lineages that the Hindu or Brahmo Bhadralok claimed as their own. Bhadralok understandings of the past, tradition, 
and folk do not incorporate or even acknowledge Perso-Arabic traditions of mythology and storytelling, which the subcontinent partakes in, and which Chodurani draws from in her writing. Delving into portable stories carried from erstwhile Arabia and Persia to early publishing circuits within colonial Bengal, and placing Chodurani's text within this milieu, I contend that familiarity with such tales provides Chodurani with a wealth of material upon which to fashion her own narrative realm and political position. The first section of this paper is titled Bengali Literary Modernity and Realism. Shoraj Bondopadhyay, in his book, Bangla Uponnashir Kalantar, The Birth of the Bengali Novel, acknowledges that Aranir Ghare Dulal laid the foundation for modern Bengali literature's commitment to realism. Bondopadhyay highlights its realist style as opposed to the parodic style of other contenders of the time, notably Kali Prashanna Shingho's Hutompacha Noksha, and gestures towards the definition of realism in terms of its effect on the reader. This is how M. H. Abrams defines realism when he asserts that, I quote, realist fiction is written to evoke the sense that its characters might in fact exist and that such things might well happen. Rup Jalal does not have this effect being set in a world populated by non-human beings and constituted by heroic quests and exploits. Another way in which realism has been defined is by way of delineating what it excludes. So the fantastic, the allegorical, and the symbolic. In order to explain these exclusions, René Wellick asserts that realism came to be defined in a particular historical context in Europe as a polemical weapon against romanticism and that it cannot be studied without reference to that context. Keeping this principle in mind, we must ask in what context realism came to be adopted as an aesthetic ideal in the subcontinent. Alka Anjaria observes that realism came to be instituted via colonial education. James Long, in one of his presidential addresses to the Vernacular Literature Society of Calcutta, urged writers to, I quote, make fiction the vehicle of history and other instruction, thus gradually superseding the old love tales. Long's old love tales, Anjaria maintains, stood for a set of indigenous aesthetic styles, such as poetical flourishes, fantastical and formulaic subjects, and unnerving variants of styles and modes, which Rup Jalal substantially embodies. The second section of this paper is titled Popular Bengali Literature of the Colonial Era. Now, Rup Jalal makes use of a non-realist mode of narration and features magical realms and non-human characters. Generic features often found within non-canonical popular Bengali literature of the time. That being said, we must keep in mind that in the Bengali literary sphere of the late colonial era, as elsewhere, there is no fixed formula for what becomes popular and what does not. Consider, for example, the difference in uptake between two texts by Dokkiranjan Mitra Mojumdar. The 1907 collection of Rupkotha or fairy tales titled Thakurmar Juli was widely read in its own time and continues to enjoy significant popularity even today. On the other hand, Thakur Dada Juli, 1909, did not secure a place for itself in Bengali cultural memory. Amrita Chakraborty points out that Thakur Tata Juli was marketed as a Bongo Uponnash Katha or Bengali oral novel, a synthetic term that did not subsequently remain in common or scholarly usage. Chakraborty's speculation notwithstanding, it is difficult and perhaps irrelevant to ascertain causality in the case of popularity with respect to fiction. What we can say for certain is that popular Bengali literature was read reviewed, remembered, and celebrated by the same Bhadraluk who were gatekeepers of Bengali high literature. As a result, such popular literature was informed by Bhadraluk notions of folk in both a demographic and a genetic sense, and was therefore majoritarian Hindu in character. In contrast, Rup Jalal draws on a different kind of literary lineage, that of Perso-Arabic folk tales and traveler's tales in Bengali translation which is the subject of the third section of this paper. Now, such tales gained an enduring public life in Bengal after being translated and adapted into the vernacular from the 17th century onwards. Meenakshi Mukherjee calls these kind of tales 
pre-novel narratives and contends that such narratives could travel easily from one culture to another. Richard Eaton points out how versions of Skandar Nama were written by luminaries such as Firdosi in Iran, Nizami in Georgia, Amir Khusro in India, and Jami in Afghanistan. This for Eaton is evidence that, and I quote, diverse peoples imagined and inhabited a single cosmopolitan space enlivened by Alexander's real or imagined exploits and helped to knit together a Persianate world across West Central and South Asia. In a similar vein, Muzaffar Alam and Sai Subramaniam outline the existence of an Indo-Persian culture, a linguistic and geographical category, which is the basis of entry into, and I quote, a shared literary canon that was transmitted with the inevitable mutations wrought by time from generation to generation. I borrow from Alam and Subramaniam this emphasis on a familiar corpus of texts which have been handed down to Muslim women from one generation to the next and have in turn influenced their own writing. Francis Pritchett shows how the Persian oral tradition of Dastan arrived in North India and gave birth to the Urdu written tradition known as Kissa. Onindita Ghosh in turn outlines how the Urdu Kissa tradition came to be adapted into a genre known as Kitcha within popular Bengali literature. To depict this mode of transmission, it would be beneficial to look at the history of performance and print associated with the Hamzanama in Urdu and Bengali. Now, the Hamzanama started out life as an oral narrative in Arabia in the 17th century. Within the same century, performances of the Hamzanama became common in Persia in the form of Dastan. Sometime between the 11th and 14th centuries, the Hamzanama found its way to the subcontinent and within Urdu spheres was performed in the tradition of Dastangoy. Oral performances of the Hamza Nama were common features in West Bengal and Bangladesh as well until fairly recently. In addition, multiple texts based on the Amir Hamza cycle stories appeared throughout the 17th and 18th centuries in Bengal. As I will show in the fourth and last section of this paper, Rup Jalal draws heavily on the Amir Hamza Kitcha for character prototypes and plot points. Now, Rup Jalal tells the story of Prince Jalal, who falls in love with a merchant's daughter named Rup Banu. A giant named Fortas murders Rup Banu's father and abducts her. Jala then <laughs> undertakes a long and perilous journey to find and destroy Rup's abductor. He fights several otherworldly beings, suffers imprisonments, and risks his life to save others. At one point, he marries a princess named Hurbanu to earn his freedom. Jalal finally kills the giant, marries Rup, and returns home to live a happy life. However, his guilty conscience makes him confess to Rup about his other marriage. And with Rup's permission, Jalal brings Hurbanu home as well. The Hamza Nama begins with Amir Hamza, a commoner, falling in love with King Naushirwan's daughter, Meher Nigar. In Rup Jalal, the class status of the male and female protagonists is reversed. It is Jalal who is the prince and Rup Banu who is the daughter of a commoner. Therefore, marriage to Jalal is advantageous for Rup and his being a prince is one aspect that makes for her happy ending in the story. In the Hamza Nama, Hamza resolves to undertake an 18-day journey to Kaf before his wedding. However, he is destined to be in Kaf for 18 years. Hamza's adventures in Kaf make up the bulk of the narrative, just as Jalal's pursuit of Fortas constitutes a major portion of Rup Jalal. While in Kaf, Hamza is forced to marry King Shahpal's daughter, Asman Pari. After 18 years of suffering, Hamza finally escapes from Kaf, returns to earth, and marries the faithful Meher Nigar. In Rup Jalal too, Jalal returns after killing Fortas to marry Rup. An interesting detail that Chodhurani adds to her story is Jalal bringing his first wife, Hurbanu, to live with him and Roop. It is almost as if Chodhurani wants to write a wrong in the Hamzanama and give both co-wives equal right to be queen to Jalal and thereby attain a happy ending. Roop Jalal read in this way functions as a model of feminine socialization that equates submissive behavior with marital bliss and happy endings. However, this obvious reading 
does not capture an important aspect of the text, the role played by older women as advisors to Rubbanu and Hurbanu within the narrative, and ostensibly to Chodhurani's own women readers and listeners. I contend that the role of these older women as storytellers who dispense much needed advice emerges when Rupcharal is read alongside another Perso-Arabic tale that had been translated into Bengali during the colonial era, The Arabian Nights. Fatima Melnisi reads The Arabian Nights as an illustration of how Muslim women have for centuries told stories to resist and escape patriarchal regimes. Melnisi treats Shahrazad, the legendary storyteller who escaped death for a thousand and one nights by telling as many tales to her husband and captor, King Shahriyar, as the archetype of Muslim women resisting and negotiating marriage through storytelling. In doing so, Melnisi also situates her own writing within this tradition, within, I quote, a genealogy of stories told by divorced aunts, wives, and widows in the maze of upstairs rooms in her childhood home. In a similar fashion, Rup Jalal needs to be read keeping in mind the cautionary tales told by older female characters and the narrator to Rubbanu and Hurbanu. Unattached to men, these older female characters are like divorced wives, widows, or aunts to Rub and Hur, telling them stories that will teach them that marriage may not be the best thing to happen to a young woman, a counterpoint to the inevitable moral framework of a romance narrative such as Rub Jalal. The advice of the older female characters inculcates Chodhurani's women readers and listeners in the belief that it may endanger a young woman to blindly. Two more minutes. All right. The advice of the older female characters inculcates Chodhurani's women readers and listeners in the belief that it may endanger a young woman to blindly respond to the advances and marital propositions of men without considering the double standards that are used to defame and humiliate women in the elite Muslim society in which they live. Shahrazad's risky conspiracy relies on Shahriyar's failure to recognize the relevance of her tales as an intervention into his cruel scheme of killing a new virgin bride each night. In a similar fashion, the efficacy of Chodhurani's tale as a tool for educating her contemporary women listeners and readers to be wary of conjugal intimacy and marriage relies on her male readers' failure to recognize the relevance of Roop Jalal as a critique of the elite Muslim society of Bengal. Nevertheless, Roop Jalal does not fail to make an impact upon its dedicated audience. Its women listeners, in fact, sit in upstairs rooms in the Zanana, listening to Roop Jalal's poir couplets recited by one among them who has been lucky enough to learn the letters. I hope to have shown in this paper how a reading of Roop Jalal in juxtaposition with Perso-Arabic tales in translation provides important insights into the nature and constitution of a reading public and how she calls into service the kind of tales that this reading public was already acquainted with intimately. Thank you. Thank you, Srijita, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, now we are moving to our last speaker, Shahzad Goni. Uh, Shahzad Goni teaches English uh, at Golshi Mahavidyalay under the University of Bardwan. He has interest in translation studies, writes poetry in Bengali, English, and Urdu, and he has interest in painting and music also. So the title of the paper is the Footsteps of Hafiz on Tagore's Road, a comparative study of the Persian poetics of Hafiz and the Gitanjali. Yes, Shahjad. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, for introducing me to the conference. And I'm really heartily thankful to Fly for giving me the opportunity to present my paper. Uh, as the time is short, I, I, I will read certain important sections from my paper. The Indo-Iranian relations go back into the ancient past it's, and its lore has been sung in strings of poets, lovers, believers and disciples of God, chronologists, leaders, kings and many more. 
So many scholarships have been done. So many lights have been thrown on the particular bond between these two countries. The melodies of Isfahan, Samarkand, Nabad, Baghdad were heard into the deep forest of the Himalayas on the banks of Yamuna and Ganga. More importantly, the linguistic association and affinity between these countries are remarkably overwhelming. In the medieval ages, Persian had been the official language of India and also played a major role in the development of many subcontinent languages. The former president of India, Dr. Sarbopoli Radhakrishnan, in his address at Tehran in 1963, mentioned the, the, the connections are not even ancient, they are modern. If you look into our art, architecture, painting and calligraphy, you will see the profound influence that Iran has exercised on us. We have an Indo-Iranian language which is spoken in many parts of our country, Urdu. And we have many universities where Persian is taught as a classical language. Bengal has been a frontier of this cultural formation. The, so the socio-religious and socio-cultural facts are undeniable. The Bengali tongue quite naturally responded to the Persian words, phrases and linguistic varieties, many of which are there in the Bengali language. As my paper deals with Rabindranath Tagore and Hafiz, I will be focusing on the 19th and 20th century Bengal scenario to a little extent, a time which can be called a transition in historical sense. Transition is because of the advent of the Britishers. The formerly Persian Arabic tradition confronted the colonial forces and managed to survive in the literary and historical waves of time. Being much aware of the Persian Arabic tradition in his contemporary time of Bengal, Tegar could not be altogether ir irresponsive to it. We must consider that, quote, every writer acts within his given socio-historic framework, unquote. Immediate prede predecessors of Tegar like Rajaraman Rai, Harihar Datta, Devendranath Tegar, Vishwanath Datta, father of Swami Vivekananda, who was well acquainted uh, in Persian also, and whose favorite book as, uh, as uh, uh, may, we know that, uh, or we may find in a book named uh, the Europe Punar Darshan uh, by Tokon Rai Choudhury, he mentions there that uh, Vishwanath Dutta's favorite book was uh, Divani Hafiz. So this kind of uh, uh, the heritage and the immediate past that would set a platform for Tegar to, to have the Persian or the Perso Arabic lineage, especially from his father. We know that Bengal's contribution to Persian, to promote Persian language and liter literature is highly remarkable. And that, uh, well, but uh, there is a different dis uh, discussion that can be done or that has been done in our conference. We have to note that, uh, we have to note that uh, the Persian manuscript it's a very important thing that may be discussed here. The Persian manuscript of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam was found in Bengal. And I will just read the source of this thing. The first English edition of Rubaiyat by Edward Fitzgerald came in the middle of the 19th century. And the manuscript Fitzgerald found was discovered by a professor of Presidency College, Calcutta, named Edward Biles Cowell at the Asiatic Society. The professor brought the manuscript to the note of Fitzgerald with a request to render it into English. And the rest of the story is well known to us. Tegar's father's fondness for Hafiz and uh, he was his ac um, acquaintance with Sanskrit also is well known. And uh, the fact is that Tegar's hospitality to receive Hafiz and Persian poetics along with Sanskrit and European learning in his literary system is a well-known thing. The process owes much to his father's Devendranath Tagore and his family lineage that was much felt and harmoniously done in the Gitanjali period. There was no clear evidence that whether Tagore had a ready command over Persian language or not, but we have a certain kind of uh, proof that uh, when he plays quite, uh, quite you can say, uh, comically or you can say brilliantly with some Persian phrases and words in a well known poem by Keats named Hyperion in Book One, where Tegar is saying that deep in the sigh of a veil, 
Far sunk in from the nafsi hayat sai moon, far from the tasti noon, and even from the star, sat ba moon is a fit Saturn, khamuz as stone. The original lines of this are deep in the shady sadness of a veil, far sunk in from the healthy breath of morn, far from the fairy moon and eve's one star, sat grey hairs, Saturn quite as stone. Tegar admits that. He had no mastery in the question, but if we take it for a while, this does not make us feel that it seems him to drink the delight from Persian poetry. In the Gitanjali phase, traces of this spiritual affinity can be located, especially of Hafiz Sirazi, one of those Persian poets of whom Tagore receives, uh, whom Tagore receives with deep respect and familiarity. Tagore's father's fondness for Hafiz is well known, as earlier discussed. Let me quote a passage by Tagore from Parashar Jatri. Quote: Persia's introduction came to me when I was a boy. It was that of the ideal Persia of the poet, the Persia which sends welcome in songs to strangers across all the barriers of geography. My father was a great scholar. He was intoxicated with Hafiz's verses. When I was a boy, I often used to listen to his recitation of those poems, and he translated them for me with fervor enjoyment that touched my heart. Unquote. But what kind of inspiration was there between his father and Hafiz, who prevailed in Iran centuries ago? This needs some verifications. Reverend Ajit Kumar Chakraborty discussed in detail in his biography of Devendranath Tagore, named Maharshi Devendranath. And enthusiastically, Satin Satish Chandra Chakraborty also added a significant study towards the end of this book. This is uh, this is a landmark in Darknath's relation with Sufism. The book also illustrates specific passages from Hafiz, which are quite relevant in context. Devendranath too quotes Hafiz's line in Persian with his own translation in his autobiography. In the deepest hour of life, he used to recite Hafiz as he articulated Upanishadic mantras. Hence, two significant philosophical qualities of the text are interrelated as a guide to him. The intellectual God, the Brahma, who, that did not satisfy him all the while. Perhaps it is the reason why he tried to quench his thirst for mysticism from Hafiz's poetry. He was a beggar of love, which the Sufis call ish, that emerged from within, defying all kind of reason of mundane explanation. Well read in Divani Hafiz, he accumulated Hafiz's verses, and while wandering or meditating upon some inexpressible experiences of life of Hafiz. That, uh, the, that she was called Hafiz Hafiz, that means a learner and adept expert in Hafiz. The, the Vav Gavya, which is considered to be the founder of Bhakti movement in Bengal, did not provide the drink she sought. Rabindran Tegar himself admits, quote, Vaishnav Dharmama, Vaishnav Dharmama, the Padabuli, Amar Pitar Vidai, the Odikar Karnai Shepakami Dhan, Amar Rashabode Shaka Chilen Hafiz. Hafiz's Hafiz's Divan, which is the first four line of which is Oh Safi, just a bitter drink, fill up and pass it round the ring. Love seemed at first an easy thing, but ah, the hard awakening. These informations may open up some of the crucial criteria which may help us to investigate the presence of Sufi elements in the Gitanjali to Hafiz in particular. Tegar's familiarity with Persian poetry had been acknowledged by him, but the striking fact is that that uh, that should give rise to the formidable analysis that Hafiz's raising popularity both in the Orient and the Occident is a possible chance for closeness of the poet of Siraj and the poet of Bengal. 
a historical review seems to be indispensable at this context. Hafiz of Siraj, whose brother has been coined by his biographers as Nisanul Ghaib or the tongue of the unseen, or Tarzuman Ulasar, the expressionist of the mysteries. Has, this, this has been received with love and fertility. His poetry is uh, appreciated by Sir William Jones as Oriental pearls at random start of his works, his bezels, of which he is uh, said to be a pioneer and fine exercisers are much applauded. Arbery states that all the copies of Hafiz's divans were probably collection <coughs> by, uh, collected by an anonymous friend of Hafiz who brought it out posthumously after Hafiz's death. The great popularity had a paradoxical result that both his poetry and biography enjoyed a substantial post posthumous evolution. Over time, a number of attributed to Hafiz's increased from 450 to 490 in the earliest known manuscript to approximately 570 for version used in the Ottoman world. Hence, Divan, Divani Hafiz in 1891 at Calcutta, it appeared as a um, printed copy uh, for, uh, in English translation also, which helped us to uh, locate that Hafiz was not only popular in the Oriental world, but he was, uh, he was popular and he was rendered into the Occidental world also. We know that Sir William Jones, Margaret Gertrude Abel, and many other poets has uh, translated Hafiz's poem into English. Hence, I would like to switch into or jump into another paragraph that uh, it is not difficult to understand the literary reception and responses of the Western scholars and poets but difficult to determine whether Tegar was familiar, familiar with these plentiful literary exercises in Europe and moved by it. But his association with European literature and land leaves clue for possibility. But certainly, it, his awareness of Persian spirit is firmly oriental rather than occidental. Since his father's unavoidable contribution strikes the strikes keynote to it, our poet is quite as quite at ease with Hafiz. And this was due to the a heretic tradition of Persian Arabic activities in various parts of Indian subcontinent and in Bengal too. Persian literatures of Fedosi, Rumi, Jami, Sadi, Attar, Sanai, Ansari, and so on was a major literary practice in the Sultanate and Mughal rule and after. Tegas' concept of Vishwa Sahitya explores a vista for his uh, study you and... Have, uh, you have two minutes to conclude. Okay, 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 sir. Tegas' concept of Vishwa Sahitya explores a vista of his studying and paradigmatic shifts and underlying studying various literature and literary systems. This is a broad attempt in the early 90s. Like or unlike Gethe's concept of world literature, Tegas' Vishwa Sahitya goes a step further and uh, questions the broadcast of national literature and also accompanies a methodology. I would like to conclude my paper with another paragraph that Tegar, like Hafiz, uh, he joins the cup in the tavern with ishq or love. He says, Chagod jude udar shure anondo gan baje, she gan kobe gobhi rabe bajbe hiya maje. Here we can associate with, with, uh, with a term, Arabic term, which is named uns. When the heart is overflowed with the love for God, there emerges a kind of joy and ecstasy at heart. In Arabic, it is called uns. And this uns at times grows so upwards that the lover converses with God, and then this state of mind is called imbesat and idlal. The oneness or vahdatul wajud of the beloved God is realized by the poet, and he is eagerly thirsty to meet the beloved. The believers called it calls it iski hakiki or love for truth that is opposed to ishki that is love for the mundane world. Here, the darkness of the night evokes a fear of the mysteries of the world unknown. Kothayalo, kothayore birohonale, jalore tara jalo, roe chedi, na chishikha, eki bhalo, chilore likha, 
বেদনা দুটি গাহিছে ওরে প্রাণ তোমার লাগি জানেন ভগবান নিচিতে ঘন অন্ধকারে ডাকেন দেখেন This is quite identical with the one of the deep lines of Hafiz. Go shama maare dar e ke imshab dar mzli se ma mahe ru se do shama mast. This is translated by Debendana Tegar in his autobiography as Amare shabhate deep aj aniyona aj ke rakti te se purna chandra amar bundhu e khane bhi aj maar. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah, you have bundhu. Yeah. Okay. বেঙ্গলি রেন্ডারিং বেঙ্গলি ট্রান্সমিশন হুইচ ইজ ইউজ বাই মেনি which is we can be called a kind of a transcription or translation by Rabindranath Tagore rather Hafiz is fused in the consciousness of Rabindranath Tagore through his father Dr Mukta Devi has corroborated that to read the Gitanjali is to chant the munazat of the Khwaja Ansari and the hymns inspired from the results of Hafiz Hafiz's traces are more in the inward of our poet than in the usage of our word practice. Thank you. Thank you, Shajad. Uh, now, uh, papers are open for question, comments, discussion. Uh, as there is no question in the chat box, so if anyone has any que question, they can now ask <laughs> you the participants. it doesn't need to be just a question it, it can be a discussion as well okay to begin the discussion uh, i'll come back to romila's uh, paper later and yeah sorry srijata srijata i was calling you srijita <laughs> anyway uh, you see um while working on that uh, apart from other few comments which i would like to compare uh, how do you or would you like to compare between uh, the historical importance of rup jalal and konkabuti if you do what would be your comment on that yeah thanks for that that's a great question um and yes a comparison is possible and um the second section of my paper which was about popular bengali literature was a little bit it came from uh, thinking along those lines it's very difficult to to causally um, determine what becomes popular and what does not and so this is all conjecture i do have um, i mean i can't even say that fazlun nasa read what i am saying she read because these are not things that the archives yield up very easily but i do have sort of um, accounts of other women from the uh, the same time who have written autobiographies i'm thinking of saida morohara khatun she has her autobiography called sriti pata in which she says that she does read these kind of materials um she also says that she reads urdu translations of these kind of materials and uh, she resents it she resents that she has to read urdu she much prefers to read bengali and she does also say that she is um, familiar with um sort of the rupkatha tradition in bengali um so yeah i don't uh, i i don't know in what way you could compare other than by conjecture and yeah. that's what i'm trying to do so, yeah. yeah but apart from conjecture also so also which you are i mean actually i was going to raise that point uh um, apart from for junnesas your paper didn't offer us uh, didn't put them at the historical there was no reference to when she was working the books that you talked about when were those published first the school library in her village in all of these and we know that uh, she had a good library i think yes. uh, if you search in bangladesh you might find a uh, more a bit more of archiving there okay yeah i actually uh, did do that i did go to bangladesh i did a field okay. work there for about 3 months 
Uh, unfortunately, again, the archives are not, you know, we cannot did be on this. Malika Begum? Did you talk to Malika Begum? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, I did. even then you could not find anything. Okay, then I can't I, say. That you I could not. Find. No, what I can say for certain is that uh, the Arabian Nights was translated in 1834. It is likely that Fezun Nessa's father's library did have a copy because Fezun Nessa herself claims that every book that was published in Bengali, oh. translations included, was in my library. Yes. So, yeah, again, conjecture, I, there is no way for me to prove this. Right, right. Okay. Um, uh, I have, so the second point was that, you know, uh, apart from the way you are trying to locate it historically, what were the sources for Fajun Nessa? If you just look at the text and compare these two texts, both of which went against the dom paradigm of novel. Konkabuti and uh, um, Rup Jalal. Just a comparative textual study also might come up with interesting insights. Uh, I remember that uh, there, there is a very good uh, post-colonial analysis of Konkabuti. And I think Rup Jalal also have this space, but there would be a big difference also, which was actually haunting my mind at that point. Uh, so you can explore those. Okay, of course, you will know what to do, but uh, because you are right now trying to put in historical perspective, maybe at a certain uh, at certain other point, you can just look at it as just text, which would be your reading. Yeah, okay. thanks for uh, that. A little bit also, I think it would help to look at how um, the Puthi tradition is yes. is also a, a, a big influence on these kinds of genres. So you that might help. The history of uh, the villages she were living in the places she went to and uh, Bangla Academy has a long a multi volume series of now uh, the dialects of each of the districts and also the folk culture of each of those districts. Now if you look into those of the area where she lived, if you map that, I think that might also give you a few more insightful uh, information. Okay. Right. Thanks Thank for that. You. Thanks so much. I just want to add one thing. Uh, Kalantor, I think Kala, that translation would be birth. Yes, I said yes. birth of the Bengali yes. novel. Was that be, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was a very good presentation. Uh, is there any question? No. Okay. So, anyone who has any other question or comment? Could I uh, pose a, I mean, it's not really a question, but I just wanted to have a conversation with Romila about something. Would that yeah, be okay? I also have, yeah, please be, start with that. I also have a few points to talk with Rom Romila. Please, please begin, start. Yeah. Uh, Romila, I, uh, obviously, because I was going to go right after you, I didn't pay attention to all of the paper as much as I could, I did. And it seems to me that um, you were saying that some of the translations of Omar Khayyam clearly used more words of Persian and Arabic origin than others do. And um, this is a, something that has been commented about uh, Nojul Islam's poetry as well. Uh, Tagore famously, I think, objected to him using the word khun in place of nokto for blood. And, um, uh, you know, retrospectively, Nojul Islam has been thought to sort of try to preserve the, uh, I suppose you could say the Islamic heritage of rural Bengal through his use of more. My brother, of uh, Sujata, if I may intervene, I mean, we are having World Nojul Congress a few months back. So um, more and more people are arguing that it is, of course, Islam's presence is there, but it is more about the Middle Eastern culture. Because yeah. when you look at I the, did not mention anything about Islamic culture. I just mentioned about the uh, Middle East culture. Uh, no, uh, Sijata was okay. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Please go ahead, Sijata. Oh no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So I was wondering if, if also in if, in the translations that you are um, looking at, if that was something um, that you can you know that you read about or have encountered or thought about. What exactly is is um, uh, the sort of rationale for using more words of Perso-Arabic origin uh, rather than Sanskritic origin when in fact standard Bengali usage at this time is highly Sanskritized. And therefore I would expect that if somebody wants to be taken seriously as a translator, 
they would use uh, more sort of Sanskritic vocabulary. Um, see, actually, this is my very first presentation, and I have no, and that I much, I don't know much about it. So whenever I just read uh, through, go went through that uh, poems by different translators, whatever came into my mind, I just wrote it down. So when I was uh, going through the Nozul's translation, I saw that there was some there's. There's a striking difference from the other mm -hmm. translators, like uh, the way he's expressing the, the words he's using. This is not very much. Uh, uh, we, we can you cannot say that it's a very sexcritized version, but this is very thing, uh, very much uh, close to Urdu or Persian thing. So that was the thing that I have noticed. Right. Thanks for that so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arumila, if we take this discussion a bit further. You know, I mean, it would be very interesting to look into the, even statistically, the uses of Sanskrit and uh, Parsa Arabic words in Nazrul, vis a vis Shakti, and Rajab. Particularly, Rajab is not a poet. I mean, not mm -hmm. a poet like Nazrul or Shakti. Yes. Poet. So, even if you do a simple statistical study, okay, and then uh, when it comes to Najrul, if then I am just wondering, that would be a very interesting project, you know. And then if you go to Najrul's a few other words, where he can see the ratio of Sanskritic and Parso Arabic, because Najrul's contribution in Bengali poetic diction is that of reminding Bengali Bhadrologs that they are not speaking the language of Bengali. Okay? They are speaking the language of one part of Bengali. Right. And he Nazir was very really conscious. The fact that we are we have been thanks to the Boshu, we have been we have grown up with this idea of Najrul being a very childish level. He was not that. So we looked uh, while we look into we, we see his conscious uses of Potshomos and Parso Arabic, particularly Arabic words. Okay. So it, these two actually, rather than when you are in a translation, because these translations are also actually intervention in the poetic diction. So if you look at these three authors, Nozul, Shokti, Retya, and then you look at how they were trying to intervene in the poetic diction, Bengali poetic diction, and I, I prefer usually for that statistic than going into an impressionist understanding. Right. Mm, I would suggest that this would, might become a very interesting study. Uh, of course, uh, I, while listening to you, I was also thinking of these uh, two models which you are referring to. Perhaps, I don't know, I mean, because you didn't refer to any theoretician or... Theory. So there are two models of translations which you are talking about in reference to your authors. One model which says that the translator's duty is to communicate what the original wanted to communicate except that okay something gets lost in translation in every translation but the responsibility of translator for one more group is or one under one model is to communicate what actually sanskrit ramayana is say we, i'm taking an example and the other model says that uh, i mean translation translator has the liberty and now this has become so poetic understanding with post-structuralist epistemological support, it has become very difficult for, to argue for the first model. Uh, but I think in this, the corpus that you have, you are actually finding material where both the models were adopted by at various periods. And interestingly, the timeline doesn't exist. I mean, doesn't work here. Because when Rejak does it, it is 2020. 2020. And so this might be another interesting approach to read your corpus. Um, okay, please, uh, participants, if you have any question, just intervene in the meantime. Uh, Shajat, Shajat, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Uh, so you see, mm, I had quite a few issues with your argument, particularly at the age of so rather than going into this i just uh, talk about uh, like perhaps when you do your final paper you see anand jagat jure anand shure anand shur baje 
or um, this song we don't need to go to hafiz i don't know how much it is the whole understanding actually goes with hafiz the god who understood rati bhakti who knew vaishnava literature um i am really not sure how much we should attribute that to hafiz so it would be interesting if you can really find traces but the two songs you have referred to um, i have i don't think because you know um, if you look kottendana prize uh rabindranath sahitya tatva or if you look uh, the vishwabharati book on rabindra darshan you will find that rabindranath's whole concept of aesthetics comes from that understanding i mean the humanist adaptation of upanishad's understanding of satchidanand so for him the world is already the expression of yes, anand so and that that he repeatedly in his lectures talk about yes, that satchid anand what has happened so that he wrote in and also the go in the morning where does hafiz come you have to search that session Uh, because okay you uh, provided us so much historical background which is a great thing Instead, but at the same time that also took the away wheelchair. your time but, for uh, but uh, uh, analyzing hafiz has to cheer in gitanjali also that in the next uh, session, you do that my suggestion would be uh, rather you that, identify he, uh, his uh, bio but he has also, uh, already uh, professor shukla's bio from the vaishnavite and opishadi traditions about creation and anandha that is true sir, but what has happened that in the meantime and then come to gitanjali and then the also trace by from hafiz's that uh, he uh, philosophy come i have then you when you okay, enter so, So, the so shall I reply that? Where, of course, you are not doing a comparative so study. You are trying to trace trace this in Gitanjali. Uh, okay, sir. I think uh, that might help. That might help us. But okay, thank you for giving such elaborate historical. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, of course, to that Hafiz was not just a poet's choice. Hafiz was part of that time's Bengali intelligentsia. and bengali yes sir yes reading huh? and interestingly in the medieval bengali writings we don't get of this but by by the time you start ramahon the whole of 19th century the first part of 19th century is so much into the parso arabic poetic tradition particularly the sufi tradition as well this will be very interesting the way you have put historically i would just uh, suggest that you also look at uh, the medieval writings not go go by the history of bengali books published by scholars of this part of india and part of the subcontinent they are these books are too much of i mean communal books read al sharif or books which uh, histories which have been published by bangladeshi scholars which have which has tried to accommodate more in data from mm, it will help thank you but okay i really regret that uh, you could not have time to actually analyze gitanjali and i i will not agree till i have you have better out डेवलपेशन Sincere research in the further uh, any kind of uh, seminars, or paper writing, or like that. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, we have utilized our one hour. I have told Professor Shukla that I was expecting a few questions from our participants, but anyway, I'm really happy that uh, I could actually be in a session where all the three presentations were very good. Thanks. by thanks to romila srijata and shajad 
and of course thanks to the organizers of fly the convener is here uh my thanks to everyone and i think uh we can now go for the next session I mean, thank you thank you thank you so much sir for this wonderful session and we will start our next session from 5 pm ist and the link I, I will post the link in the chat box for the next session okay thank you so much thank you so much